still, in conjunction with Skanska and C Skills Awards, the awarding organisation of CITB, have produced this video to promote the safe use of cut-off saws within the construction industry. This video will show you the procedures and safety precautions you need to correctly operate a petrol-driven cut-off saw. It's extremely important you consult the instruction manual for every cut-off saw that you use. Steel products continually change and are updated, so if your saw differs to the one you see in the video, please consult your steel dealer for any advice you may need. Hello, my name's Andy Pascal, and this here is Nathan Kelly. Today we're going to talk to you about cut-off saw safety. First things first, we always have to bear in mind PPE, which is personal protective equipment. It's paramount that every time you go to use the saw, you're geared up the right way to use it safely. Nathan here, my faithful assistant, he's <laughs> going to be showing us the ropes in terms of what to wear. I'll talk you through it as we go. First of all, okay. we're going to look at the boots. Okay, the boots should be sturdy, they should be steel toe cap safety boots with a good grip on the undersole. Okay, as we work up, you can see Nathan's got a lovely pair of bright yellow high-vis trousers, which are snug fitting, not too baggy, not hanging off the back end of him, but also they should be flame retardant material, i.e. Um, flame retardant cottons or leather apron. Same with the top area as well. It should be snug fitting, there shouldn't be any loose items of clothing, especially when you look around the neck area. No jewellery, no scarves, no ties. Working our way up, Nathan's going to pop on his high visibility vest now. So again, be seen and not heard, is what I like to think of Nathan anyway. Easy. Again, the high visibility vest should be of the same theory as the trousers. It should be snug fitting, because that could get caught up in the saw when you're using it. Okay, next thing, we're looking at the dusk mask. It needs to be a minimum of FFP3, so that's protection against the material that's coming towards your face, all the dust material which is extremely dangerous if inhaled. Nathan's going to show you how to fit it correctly. Nice and tight round the face so it's, it's holding everything in place so you're not going to get any loose parts where the dust is likely to come through. Making sure it's nice and tight and it's fitted nicely around the nose there. Okay. So in theory that will give you one of the highest protections there is in terms of ingesting and inhaling dust particles coming from the machine depending on what you're cutting. You can either wear goggles and or safety glasses and or um, a face screen on your helmet. Again, this all depends on what your individual site specific risk assessments entail as well. Nathan's got the goggles on there. Next we're looking at the helmet. So helmet to protect your head with integrated ear defence there to protect your ears from excessive noise from the saw and also from surrounding uh, machinery being used as well. Okay. Finally, Nathan's going to pop on the gloves. The gloves should be um, fitted nice and snug but also give plenty of grip when holding on to the saw and will actually help to defend Nathan's hand and body actually against vibrations created by the saw. So it's really important that the gloves are worn. Once Nathan's got those gloves on, he's PP'd up and we're ready to rock with the saw. In this section, we're gonna look at pre-user checks. Before you do any of your checks, if the machine's handed over by a hire company, always make sure that they do the correct handover procedure so they talk you through the, the saw, the ins and outs, and what to check for. In conjunction with that, we recommend to read through the manual. On the machine itself, for your pre-user checks, just have a good look over the machine. Lift it up, have a look under the machine, make sure there's no visual cracks, make sure there's no deformities, anything that looks out of place. If there's something not quite right on that machine, then put it down, don't use it, and inform your supervisor at that point. First things first, we're gonna look at the pull cord. The pull cord should look very similar to that. It shouldn't be frayed, there shouldn't be heavy wear on the cord itself. The worst thing that you can experience is out in the field, you try and pull the machine over, the thing snaps, goes back in, it's a nightmare, then you have to take it, get it fitted. If um, there is any severe fraying or any fraying or heavy fraying on there, get it replaced. The on-off switch should be free moving and should switch straight into the off position. 
which is a key feature, especially when using the machine, to make sure you can switch it off if there's an emergency or any need to do so. Then we're going to look at the choke system. Okay, The choke system should be free moving into the full choke position, back to the half choke position, and then finally into the normal running position. Next to the choke, you have your primer bulb. The primer bulb itself, again, free moving, it should be nice and easy to push in and then it should re refill up. When you've got the fuel in, you'll see that in greater detail. Before you start the machine, you can pop in the decompressor. It should feel a positive click in. If you don't do that, you can cause excessive wear on the actual rotor system, but also it's harder to pull the machine over. Extremely key thing to bear in mind is make sure that the whole handle arrangement is clean. The front and rear handle should both be clear of any grease or any damage as well. Working our way upwards, the guard itself needs to be in the correct position for the application. It shouldn't be too free easy moving, but there should be a firm movement to it and then it should be secured in location. Okay, so it shouldn't be too free and easy, otherwise it's gonna move out of position when you come to use it. Finally, inspection of the water suppression area. Okay, again, this should be free of any cracks and any breakages. When removing the water part, it should easily pull off and there should be a positive click and then that will allow the water flow through to suppress the dust. Once we've done all our pre-user checks, we can crack on with using the saw. Okay, in this section, we're gonna take a look at selecting the correct wheel for your application and fitting it properly to your machine. It's important only ever to use a wheel that's been recommended by the manufacturer or a wheel that's technically equivalent. To select the correct wheel for your application, you must consult either the information on the wheel itself or the packaging it comes in. Visually check your wheel for any cracks or deformities. You may have to look carefully on the wheel to inspect and see any chance that there may have been any breaks or any deformities at all. If there's anything found and you're in any doubt, do not use this wheel. Another thing you'll want to check is that the maximum operating speed of the wheel is equal to or greater than the spindle speed of the machine. You can find out the maximum operating speed either on the disc itself or on its packaging. You can then cross check that with the information either on the machine or in the owner's manual. For abrasive wheels, you'll need to check the date stamp on the wheel and make sure that the wheel is within its usable date range. Okay, at this point you'll want to check that the spindle size of the wheel is compatible with the spindle size of the machine. It's not advised to use any sort of spindle adapter kits. It's not safe to do so. Okay, so now you've picked out the correct wheel and you know it's safe to use, it's time to show you how to fit it correctly. To fit a wheel correctly to this machine, you'll just need a locking pin, which goes in on the back, and then use the combi spanner to undo the main nut. Once you've slackened it off, just continue on doing it by hand and remove the flange that secures the wheel. Once that flange is removed, you can then fit the correct wheel for the application. Once that wheel is located correctly on the spindle, placing the flange, it's important to make sure the lugs are engaged correctly. So once you can see that that's happened, just finger tighten the bolt on the main spindle. Once it's finger tight, back with your combi spanner. Okay, and as a final check, just push with your thumb until it's nice and tight. If you're using a diamond wheel, it's important to make sure that the rotation arrows on the wheel correspond directly with the rotation arrows on the machine. Operators like yourself should always consider the site-specific risk assessment. Each site differs, so whether it's moving plant, whether it's cranes working overhead, each site-specific risk assessment needs to be adhered to. You should make yourself aware of the ins and outs and the do's and don'ts. Other things to consider as well is your exclusion zone. 
Make sure there's a free meter perimeter at all times maintained, whether it's through signage or whether it's through um, cordoned off areas. Make sure that the area is clear, make sure it's well signed and people are aware of where you're working at all times. We have a refueling area set up well over three metres from where we're actually using the saw. The fuel can is situated within the bund and the working area or exclusion zone is well over three metres away from the fueling area. We have our fuel area clearly designated. Heading over to the exclusion zone itself, you can see within that area the ground is nice and firm underfoot. Most of the ground along the way and especially within our cutting area is nice and solid. When cutting the material you need to make sure that the material is secure. Like these bricks in this jig, it's just going to allow me for a nice neat cut without the material actually moving when I'm trying to cut it. Also what you can see is that we have a water butt and I have my mask. Two very important things when using the saw. Silica dust is one of the leading causes of lung function disorders. To help prevent the inhalation of silica dust, you should wear a dust mask, minimum protection of FFP3, and of course, use water at all times when cutting silica-based products. Okay, so we're now at the stage where we can look at the safe starting procedure for your saw. The first thing you'll want to do is just to make sure that the ground is level and you will want to set up an exclusion zone around the area to make sure that people won't come wandering through to where you're going to begin using your machine. Another key point is that fueling must be at least three meters away from where you're going to be using your saw to make sure you're not gonna have any flammable liquids in contact with the hot exhaust on the machine. You'll always want to start your machine from the ground, never drop start it. Okay, so the first thing you'll want to do is to move the switch into the start position. First you'll put your hand on the top of the handle, pull the throttle and then move the switch into the start position. Then release the throttle and finally take your finger off the, the start lever. Another thing to remember is to press the decompression valve to make sure the machine is easy to start. Once that's been done, you'll just need to set the choke into the fully on position for a cold machine or the half choke position for a machine that's already been warmed up. Then just press on the pump primer seven to ten times to make sure that there's fuel in the machine. Then you'll put your left hand on the front handle, your foot on the back of the machine and you're ready to pull the starting cord. Uh, when you do, don't let it snap back or you could damage the machine. Okay, so now we've got all of our procedure done, we're ready to put on our PPE and start the saw. First things first, always consider how you're going to be using the saw. The front handle should be held with your left hand, the rear handle with your right hand. Never to be used the other way, so it's only designed to be used right-handed. Also, always to be used with both hands, never used with just a single hand. Other things to consider when you're using it, nice firm surface. This is perfect, never to be used on an unstable surface or up a ladder and also never to be used over shoulder height. So the surface you're cutting on needs to be stable underfoot and the material that you're cutting needs to be securely fixed to the floor. The water supply is extremely important for dust suppression. Connect it up to the machine, positive connection in, and then you've got the control valve which is situated just next to it. And now Nathan's gonna pump it to make sure it's at full pressure. So a good few pumps so you know that it's pressurized up and then finally he's going to mark his chalk line. Other things to consider, when you're using the saw, the operation, how the saw is going to manoeuvre once it's in the cut, but also how you're cutting in terms of not allowing that cut to pinch or cause any problems that might 
um, increase the risk of, of that sore kicking out. In the case of an emergency, the machine must be switched off and placed safely on the floor. Regular breaks when operating the saw are recommended, especially during prolonged use. For this cut, we're gonna show you the horizontal cutting method. It's important to remember that this is actually slightly more difficult than doing a standard cross cut. So Nathan's gonna show you now the wraparound handle, and that is the position that the machine should be held at when doing the cut. The natural way the machine's gonna lie, it's gonna sometimes wanna veer either one way or the other. The trick with this is to not apply any lateral pressure, to try and keep that saw as flat as possible so you don't get any pinching pressure, but also not to put your body weight behind it. We can show you that it's a lot easier in this position to actually apply lateral pressure or pressure from the body if you put your body weight behind it, you can put too much force on the head end, which can eventually cause on kick out, but also maybe breakages or pinching point on that saw blade itself. Now we've done the talking, Nathan's gonna show you exactly how to use the saw. Clearly, Nathan is in control of the cut, guiding the saw in a smooth back and forth motion. With each motion, he is removing a small amount of material, no greater than six centimeters in depth. The body position in this case is important to keep the saw in a straight line. Try not to stand too far away from the saw as this will put more pressure on your arms. But on the flip side, don't push up against the saw with your body. Secure pipes and round bodies so they don't roll away. When determining the cutting line, try to avoid reinforcement, especially in the direction of the severing cut. With openings and recesses, the sequence of cuts is very important. Always make the last cut so that the cutting wheel does not become jammed and be mindful of where the severed parts may land. If necessary, leave small ridges that hold the part that is to be separated in position. You can break these ridges later and before finally separating the part, always determine how heavy the part is and the direction that it may move after separation and whether it may be under tension. Grind a guide groove along the pre-marked line. Deepen the cuts with even back and forth motions. For small corrections of direction, do not tilt the cutting wheel. Always reposition it accordingly. If necessary, leave small ridges that hold the part to be separated in position. Break these ridges at a later point. The most frequently occurring reactive forces are kickback and pull-in. Kickback occurs when the cutoff machine is suddenly thrown up and back in an uncontrolled arc towards the operator. Kickback may occur if the cutting wheel becomes jammed or is subjected to heavy contact with a solid object embedded in the material. Never use the upper quarter of the abrasive wheel for cutting. The abrasive wheel must be introduced into the cut with extreme care and without twisting or pushing. Always remember when cutting metal to consider the direction of the hot metal sparks. Think about the weather conditions. Is it windy? Could that carry the sparks further? Be aware that the object to be cut may move and other factors may cause the cut to close and jam the wheel. The material must be secured and supported so that the cut remains open during and after cutting. Pre-marking a cutting line on the material will allow for a more accurate cut. If you deviate from the original cut, don't tilt the cutting wheel to correct the line. Tilting and lateral pressure can increase the risk of injury through wheel breakage and possible kickback. Pull the saw out of the cut and reset the wheel against the cutting line, then continue. The cutting depth for each operation should not exceed five to six centimeters. Cut thicker materials in several passes. 
The operation should be performed with even back and forth strokes, ensuring not to apply excessive load to the cutting wheel. Always work with water when using diamond cutting wheels. This will aid in reducing friction, lowering the risk of kickback. Remember the machine will naturally pull forward away from you when the abrasive wheel comes in contact with the object to be cut. The adjusting range of the guard is determined by a stop pin. Never attempt to push the guard over the stop pin. Set the guard correctly for the cutting wheel so the particles of material are guided away from you and ensure it is positioned correctly for the application. When using a cut-off saw for prolonged periods on the ground, maybe cutting asphalt or concrete, it's recommended to use a cart. The cart helps to reduce vibration it helps to reduce the risk of kickback and also reduces the risk of fatigue. Nathan's now going to show you exactly how it works. Please take it away, sir. When cutting bricks, it's extremely important to make sure that they're firmly secured as to how you're cutting them. You don't want movement and you don't want to have to put your foot on there to secure them. Something like a jig, helps to secure the bricks, keeps them all in line, gives you a nice straight cut all the way through, stopping the bricks from moving as you're cutting. To load up this jig, it's very simple. Bricks go in. This particular uh, jig will take up to 10 bricks. Make sure both sides are secured in place. And then finally, this top cover goes on. So then you have your guide for your cut-off saw to work along the brick. When you need to refuel, you need to set up an area like we have behind us here. There's some considerations that need to be made when you're setting up your fueling zone. Number one, just ensure that you're away from any source of ignition and any source of heat as well to reduce the likelihood of any fire. Number two, try to make sure that the machine has a chance to cool down slightly. Again, heat is an ignition source. And number three, any spillage of fuel needs to be dealt with immediately. If you get any fuel spilt on your clothes, they need to be changed straight away. Now Nathan's gonna show us exactly how to refuel safely. Nathan's going to give a wipe around the neck and round the fuel cap itself to make sure that when he opens up the cap that no debris falls into the tank. And cautiously he will release the pressure on the fuel tank, pull the cap off, so now it's ready to fuel up. Nathan can then remove the cap from the fuel can itself. This fuel can's got an auto fill mechanism on it. It's important to release any pressure from the can at this point. The fuel can can then be positioned over the neck of the fuel tank itself on the machine. With a bit of gentle pressure, push down onto the base of the fuel can to allow the tank to fill up. Once the tank is full, it's important to then ease the spout away from the tank, ensuring that there's no spillages. Again, if there is any spillages, make sure you deal with them appropriately. Once that's done, the fuel cap can then be replaced onto the fuel can itself, and then the fuel cap onto the machine. It's important that this is done correctly so there's no spillages when using the machine. Now, with a positive downward pressure and a bit of a turn clockwise, you should hear a positive click. At that point, the two lugs on the fuel cap should then be parallel to the machine itself. Give it a little test, make sure that it is firmly in situ. So now Nathan's filled up that machine safely he can now crack on with his work at least three metres away from the refuelling zone. Other important things that need to be considered when setting up your refuelling zone 
is to make sure you're away from any drainage systems and that when you're finished using the fuel can, make sure it's safely stowed away in a bund. I can't stress enough how important it is to change your clothes if you get any fuel spilled on them. This is what can happen, even with flame retardant clothing. Now Nathan's finished his work, he's going to show us how to transport and store the machine correctly. As you can see, he's holding the machine with the blade pointing behind him. This is the safest way to transport the machine when you're not using it. Now Nathan's going to pop the machine in the back of the van and showing us briefly how to remove the actual blade because we always recommend that the blade's removed when you store the machine. When you're removing the blade, you want to use your stop pin again. We're popping in the locking pin and then undo it with the combi wrench. Once the blade's removed, Nathan's then going to store it in a safe box so it doesn't rattle around, move around, causing risk of breakage to the actual blade itself, like so. Once that's safely away, then he can look to securing his machine to the back of his van. To do that, maybe a bit of bungee, a bit of rope, anything that's just going to stop the machine from moving about, causing damage to the machine and damage to anything else you may have in the back. I want to leave you with one final thought. Always consider your own safety and the safety of your workmates. And if you're ever unsure, consult your supervisor or refer to the operator's manual. Okay, come on mate, that's us for the day. Music to my ears. <laughs>